Hello and welcome to the first lecture for exam 3. This is going to cover infection and infectious disease. So it's really going to be talking about a lot of definitions in terms of what is infection, what is a disease, how does our body protect us from infections, and where are these infections coming from? What can even infect us? So let's start off by talking about microorganisms on and in our bodies. So you are actually covered in microorganisms right now. Look at your hands, look at your arms. You don't see anything because they're microscopic, but you absolutely do have microorganisms living on your skin. And that's fantastic because it's going to, they're going to do a lot of benef beneficial things for us and protect us as we'll see. And there are pros and cons and we'll talk about both of those. But microorganisms, we talked about six major groups of microorganisms not that long ago. And remember those six major groups were archaea, bacteria, fungi, viruses, helminths, or parasitic worms, and protozoa. And both helminths and protozoans would belong to that kind of parasitic group down there. So all of these types of microorganisms can potentially inhabit us. They can grow on or in us, replicate on or in us, potentially cause infections. And so throughout this lecture, we'll go more in depth on what type of microorganisms do inhabit us and where those infections come from if they're pathogenic. Now, all of those wonderful microorganisms that are calling your body home are called your normal microbiota or your normal flora. And as you saw on the last slide, there are lots of types of bacteria, viruses, fungi, different types of microorganisms that are inhabiting your body right now, but they aren't causing harm. They aren't making you sick. And this is a phenomenon known as commensalism. So they're not causing any harm to the host. They're just living their life on your skin or in your body. And this is our good bacteria, our normal microbiota. And what's so good about it is that it's actually going to compete with pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic bacteria that you come into contact with uh, on your skin by touching something or by breathing something in, our normal microbiota can compete with that bad bacteria. And this is called mutualism. It prevents that pathogenic bacteria from infecting and colonizing us, which is great because now both bacteria and the host, us, are benefiting from that relationship. And that's fantastic. We need our normal microbiota. So normal biota, normal flora, normal microbiota, those all mean the same thing. If you see them kind of uh, switched in and out for each other, just know they mean the same thing. And they all mean and are referring to the microorganisms that normally inhabit our body. What is the original source of our normal flora? Well, it's really from our environment. So whenever you're born and you are exposed to the air, you're exposed to different people touching you, you're exposed to different surfaces, it's that contact and interaction with your environment that's really going to introduce and start to flourish that uh, and build your normal microbiota. Normal flora versus pathogenic flora. So know that your normal flora is your good bacteria Pathogenic flora is the bad bacteria. Your normal flora, for the most part, leads to protection. And then the bad bacteria or pathogenic flora can lead to disease. This isn't a 100% of the time this always happens. This is just the general understanding between our normal flora and then potential pathogenic bacteria. And you'll see that the normal flora leads to protection down here on the surface of this, these epithelial cells by covering the surface of the cells and not leaving any room for this bad bacteria to make a home. So they're taking up all the space and all the nutrients and then the pathogenic bacteria cannot bind and replicate. But if we lose a bunch of our good bacteria, these are, all start dying off, now there's plenty of space and nutrients available for this pathogenic bacteria to bind and then make a home and then start uh, releasing virulence factors and potentially make you sick. So that's the 
very kind of cut and dry delineation between normal flora and pathogenic flora. And we'll see though that there are plenty of types of bacteria and microbes that do kind of cross the line between being normal flora and being pathogenic, but this is the understanding between the two. Whenever you have this change in the type of bacteria that is inhabiting you, this is called dysbiosis. And that's whenever the type of bacteria that is inhabiting you shifts to include more pathogenic bacteria than it normally does. Some examples of normal flora that are just probably hanging out on you right now. On skin, there's commonly Staphylococcus aureus and even more commonly Staphylococcus epidermidis. So that's very common to be on your skin. Staphylococcus aureus is common for in your nose. In our mouths, we have Streptococcus mutans, which is commonly going to be the cause of dental caries or cavities. In our large intestines, we have lots of coliforms. Coliforms are gram-negative rods that are often within the Enterobacteriaceae or, with, or really just organisms like E. coli that live in the intestines. And then the female vagina has things like lactobacillus, candida albicans. Lactobacillus is really important for maintaining that acidic pH of the vagina. Then over the next couple slides, we'll talk about uh, which sites have the most extensive flora, which body sites have the most uh, the highest density of bacteria, and then which sites are sterile and have absolutely no bacteria. The body sites that have the most extensive flora, or the highest density and diversity of microorganisms, is the skin and the colon, or the gut. But remember that you do have microorganisms other than these two places, like your skin and your upper respiratory tract, but these two sites have the most microorganisms present. And the skin makes sense, right? It's constantly coming in contact with your environment, with uh, all the microbes in the air, with everything that you're touching. It makes sense that you'd need this protective layer of normal flora to protect you from coming into contact with pathogenic bacteria. Your skin has two types of populations, a transient population that's easily washed off, and then a resident population that lives deeper within your skin, deep within glands or hair follicles, and you need this resident population to repopulate your skin's normal flora after you take a shower or take a bath and you wash off that normal flora. Then the bacteria that lives deeper in your skin can start replicating and repopulate that normal flora. And then of course, your gut, you may have heard of gut health, you may have taken probiotics or prebiotics in the past, and this is all of that resident bacteria that's hanging out in your gut, and it's not just helping with digestion. Your gut microbiota, by certain scientists and researchers, is considered its own organ because it's so essential for our function, for a lot of our functions, not just digestion. It's going to help with things like the immune system. It's going to help with brain function and brain health. And we'll dive more into the gut later on. Just know that the skin and your gut have the most extensive and diverse microbiota in your body. So now we know our normal flora is great, but there are sites of the body that are sterile and shouldn't have any normal microbiota. These sites include our internal tissues and organs like our heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, brain, and bones, and then fluids that go through our body as well, like cerebrospinal fluid and blood. When microbes are in these sites of the body, there's an active infection happening. And you have your immune system to help clear these infections, but there's no normal flora present in order to prevent some patho pathogenic bacteria from binding to that tissue. So what role does normal microbiota play in protecting against disease? Well, it's a mutualistic relationship. It is able to grow and thrive on our bodies while protecting us from potential pathogenic microorganisms. Our normal microbiota is actually part of our first line of defense for our immune system, as we'll see later. But it's there as a protective layer against potential pathogenic organisms that may cause disease. Not all microorganisms of our normal flora are completely harmless. Many of the microbes that make up our normal flora are opportunistic microorganisms. These are organisms that are normally harmless, especially for healthy individuals, 
but they will cause disease if given the opportunity, hence the name. The opportunity they're often taking advantage of is a compromised host defense, like people who are immunocompromised and have weakened immune systems. An example is AIDS patients who suffer from pneumocystic pneumonia. AIDS patients have very weakened immune systems as a result of HIV targeting and destroying white blood cells. If their respiratory tract is colonized with this fungus, pneumocystic gyrovecchiae, then this organism can easily take advantage of the weakened immune system to proliferate and cause a lung infection. About 20% of the population has this pneumocystic uh, gyrovecchiae in their respiratory tract, but for healthy people with normal immunity, it remains part of the normal flora and doesn't lead to an infection. So what role does normal microbiota play in causing disease? Well, part of our normal microbiota includes opportunistic microorganisms. These are organisms that take the opportunity to cause an infection that may lead to disease if you have a weakened immune system. An important aspect of discussing infection and infectious disease is understanding the relationship between microbes and disease. This is one of the earliest questions that was explored once we understood that tiny, invisible things could cause sickness. We wanted to answer the question, how do we know that a given pathogen causes a specific disease? Because once we know that, we can identify signs and symptoms of the disease and hopefully target the pathogen. Robert Koch developed a list of postulates in the late 1800s to hopefully do just that. So here are Koch's postulates. The idea is that a pathogen must meet all of these criteria in order to definitive, definitively link it with causing a certain disease. So first, the pathogen must be present in every case of the disease. The pathogen must be isolated from the diseased host and grown in pure culture. If this pure culture is used to inoculate a healthy, susceptible host, then that host will experience the same disease. And then the pathogen must be recovered from that experimentally infected host. And in the next slide, we'll see a diagram of these postulates and we'll review these postulates again. So you'll see from this image of Cox postulates, we're trying to link the presence of a pathogen with the presentation of a specific disease. This was often done in animal models, so with mice or rats. And so let's go through these postulates again. First off, we have a diseased individual and you identify a pathogen. That identified pathogen is then grown in pure culture. So we, it has been isolated and grown in pure culture. That pure culture pathogen is then inoculated into a healthy individual that is not experiencing the disease. Once it's been inoculated, if this pathogen truly, truly causes this disease, then this healthy individual should experience the disease. From the healthy, uh, from the inoculated, experimentally inoculated host, then you should be able to isolate that pathogen again in pure culture and identify it as the same pathogen. So Cox postulates are great, right? They're easy enough to follow. And they were a very important first step for understanding the relationship between microbes and disease. But do these rules work 100% of the time? Absolutely not. There are limitations to Cox postulates. First off, these are done in animal models. And animal models are not a one-to-one -one comparison with human anatomy. So what you see and experience in, a, in an animal model is not always um, identified in a human model. And then isolating these pathogens in pure culture, everything is not so easy to isolate, especially if it's a virus and it needs some type of host cell present, it's not easy to isolate an organism. Also, this disease, with the presence of the pathogen in the host, the disease has to be present every single time. And different types of hosts, just like with people, uh, people can present with the disease differently and experience different ranges of signs and symptoms, with, uh, even with the same pathogen infecting them. So there are limitations to this. Now, people rely a lot more heavily on genomics and DNA sequencing to specifically identify a certain pathogen that's causing an infection. Now back to this image right here, microorganisms on and in our bodies. We already talked about how these are these six 
major microorganisms, so archaea, bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, including helminths and protozoans. But if you look over here, four types of pathogens, and the word pathogen here is very important because a pathogen is a microorganism that can cause disease. So if you see here, the four types are viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, including those helminths and protozoan parasites. You'll see that archaea did not make the list over here as a type of pathogen. That's because there are no known archaea to cause disease in humans. Therefore, they are not pathogens. So the four types, make sure you know the four types of pathogens and the definition of what a pathogen is. Now we're going to jump into talking a little bit more about pathogens. Where do they live? How do they go from person to person or place to place? How are these different diseases acquired? All of that fun stuff. So first off, where do pathogens live? So the home of a pathogen or a microorganism that can cause disease is called its reservoir. And that's its natural location. That's where it's normally in the environment, the place it lives before it causes an infection. So you, if you're going to get infected by it, have to come into contact with the reservoir in order to come in contact with the microorganism so you can be infected by it. And reservoirs can be animate or inanimate, so living or non-living. A reservoir may be a human for different types of diseases that are transmissible from human to human, like measles or the common cold or HIV. The reservoir could be an animal for zoonotic diseases or diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. Examples are rabies and salmonella. And a reservoir can just be the soil or the environment anything out in the world that's non-living. So a water source, a water source, soil, trees, all of that stuff is included within environment. So make sure you know the three types of reservoirs for infections or the three types of reservoirs for these different pathogens. It can be humans, animals, or the environment. And recognize here that that's really covering all of our bases. So these pathogens, depending on the type of pathogen, can really be present almost anywhere. So now we know pathogens can have a variety of different reservoirs or homes, but how is that pathogen actually being transmitted? Or what's actually causing the infection to the host? How is the pathogen getting from point A, its reservoir, to point B, the host? So we're gonna talk about a few examples here. First off, we have droplet transmission. So this would be an aerosolized droplet. So think coughing or sneezing, aerosolizing these droplets in the air for the potential of someone else to breathe it in or get it on their hands or in their eyes. Another example is fomites. And fomites, if you recall, are just really any inanimate object that can hold on to microbes or pathogens. So it can be the desk you're sitting at, your phone, your computer, anything that can harbor a pathogen is a fomite. And then we have direct contact. So this would be like it sounds, direct contact like skin to skin or direct contact with an animal. And then we have vehicle transmission. And on the next slide, we'll see some examples of this. But vehicle transmission is talking about an indirect transmission of this pathogen from an inanimate source. And then we have vector transmission. And vector transmission is talking about a living agent that is carrying or transmitting that pathogen from point A to point B. And there are two types of vector transmission. There's biological and mechanical. Biological is active transmission. So it would be like mosquitoes carrying a disease, for example, malaria. And they're transmitting that protozoan that causes malaria to people. So that is active um, it's a living thing, a mosquito, that is actively transmitting that pathogen to the host. And then we have a mechanical vector. And a mechanical vector, instead of being active, is more of a passive action. It's kind of carrying a pathogen from point A to point B passively. So the example here would be a fly that you're out having a nice picnic and this fly 
lands on some dog poop, and then lands on your burger that you're eating. So that was passively transmitting pathogens from one place, from feces, to another, your food. Not, not the most fun example, but that's a good way to remember it. Another mechanical vector could be ourselves whenever you walk into your house with dirty shoes, for example. So here are some examples of vehicle transmission. And vehicle transmission, remember, is that indirect transmission of the pathogen using some non-living source. So most commonly, this is going to be something in the air like fungal spores, but really water and foodborne pathogens are the most common things for vehicle transmission. So all foodborne illnesses, the vehicle for transmitting that pathogen to humans is the food. And then there are a lot of waterborne illnesses, especially areas that don't have access to clean water. The example here is cholera, and we'll talk more about that later on in the semester. Another way that diseases can be transmitted is through a carrier. So a carrier harbors the pathogen or the infectious agent without showing signs or symptoms. So they don't look sick, but they can still make someone else sick. And this can happen during different stages of the disease. So an incubatory carrier is someone that can transmit the disease during the incubation period. So you don't know you're sick yet, but you can make someone else sick and you can transmit that pathogen. A convalescent carrier can transmit that pathogen during the convalescent period. So it'll look like someone has recovered from the disease, but they still harbor a large enough amount of that pathogen that can be transmitted to someone else. And then a chronic carrier is someone that harbors the pathogen for a long period of time. That could be over months, years, or for life, and can potentially transmit that to someone at any point. An example of this is Typhoid Mary, or Mary Mallon, if you've heard of this story. She was the first known case of a healthy carrier for a disease in the United States. And she was a chronic carrier for Salmonella typhi or the organism that causes typhoid fever. And she was actually a cook for different domestic food positions in New York, so she would work with for different families and cook for them. And it was observed that there was this outbreak of typhoid fever in the early 1900s as uh, Mary was cooking for different families. And this outbreak was investigated by different sanitary engineers at the time, and it kind of led back to Mary. And people didn't really understand carrier states at the time. They didn't understand disease transmission and the epidemiology of the disease. And so the solution at the time was to force Mary into quarantine. And her over the length of her life, she was forced to quarantine for a total of 26 years. So she was taken out of her domestic food positions, of course, and then forced to quarantine and had a lot of tests done in order to understand this carrier state. So unfortunate for Mary. There is a uh, concerning typhoid fever though. Salmonella typhi is actually transmitted through the fecal oral route. So Mary also could have done a better job of hand washing, which is unfortunate. But this is just the, the primary example of a carrier state, but this is really common in lots of different diseases, not just salmonella typhi or typhoid fever. For example, with uh, COVID, people were recommended to, after you have recovered or after you have experienced, you know, um, A, B, and C, then you're allowed to go out and talk to people again. You have to wait a certain number of days. So that quarantining was to limit how many people would be infected whenever someone was in this carrier state of the disease. Portals of entry and exit are also important considerations when talking about the transmission of diseases. I'm not going to ask you anything too much in depth with this on the test. I just want you to be aware that different types of pathogens can have different portals of entry or exit. For example, with typhoid Mary and the transmission of Salmonella typhi, that's a fecal oral route. So the portal of exit would be the anus and the feces, and then the portal of entry to a new host would be the mouth and then ultimately to the digestive system. Now different types of disease acquisition. 
how are diseases being acquired within a population? There's two major ways. Diseases can be communicable or propagated. So they can be transmitted from person to person or host to host. And they can be non-communicable or common source diseases. And this is when they are not spread from host to host. So the source could be your own normal flora. It could be an opportunistic pathogen on your skin, for example. Or it could be from a non-living environmental reservoir, like a food source or a water source. And these are non-communicable diseases. Because, for example, you have potato salad at a party. That potato salad has some type of infectious agent in it. Everyone who eats that potato salad gets sick. So it's not being transmitted from person to person. It's coming from a common source, that potato salad. Compared to communicable diseases or propagated diseases like the common cold, for example, that's transmitted from host to host from sneezing on someone directly maybe, or sneezing on their phone, and then indirectly they're coming into contact with that pathogen. So definitely know the difference between these two. And on the next slide, we'll see a graph that explains it as well. Now this graph is showing you kind of a visual representation of propagated versus common source epidemics. On the Y axis, we have incidents. This is the number of new cases that are occurring. And then on the x-axis, we have the number of days. So you'll see for a common source outbreak, like food poisoning, like potato salad that's gone bad, over a short amount of time, you have a lot of cases happening because at that one point in time, a lot of people had that bad potato salad. A propagated epidemic occurs over a long period of time because it's transmitted from host to host or person to person. So that means it spreads through the population slowly and kind of more consistently. Whereas the common source outbreak is a short period of time. Specifically looking at communicable diseases here, communicable diseases or propagated diseases, the type of disease that can move from host to host, there are two different patterns of transmission for these diseases. There is vertical and horizontal. Vertical transmission or the transmission from host to host comes from a parent to child transmission. And this could be through the placenta um, during birth or through milk. And then horizontal transmission is more so what's occurring day to day with like the common cold. And this is direct or indirect transmission. So directly coming in contact with someone, whether it's direct contact or through droplets, or coming into contact with an infected uh, fomite, horizontal transmission is all other means of transmission outside of this vertical transmission from parent to child. Now, over the next few slides, we're gonna talk about nosocomial infections. And this is really important for this lecture, talking about infections, because nosocomial infections are a very important type of infection, but also I always feel like it's very important for you guys taking this course to talk about this because often you guys are either planning on entering the health field or you're already doing something within the health field. Nosocomial infections are any disease that's acquired during a hospital stay. So it's specifically talking about hospitals. Most commonly, these infections are going to be urinary tract infections, respiratory tract infections, and any type of infection following surgery. Most commonly, the organism that's going to cause these infections are going to be gram-negative intestinal flora, maybe from fecal contamination, types of E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Staphylococcus. This graphic is showing you the most common types of nosocomial infections or hospital-acquired infections, and you'll see by far the most common is urinary tract infections, and that's most commonly going to be from the use of catheters but also the infection of surgical sites is very common and respiratory infections as well. What factors play a role in nosocomial infections? What makes someone more likely to have an infection in the hospital compared to someone else somewhere else? And there's some important factors here to consider. First off, compromised host. 
Often, people in the hospital or patients in the hospital are immunocompromised or have a weakened immune system. That could be from a disease they have, from a therapy they're receiving, from a surgery they just experienced. And then we have hospital transmission. Hospitals are busy places, so the chance for transmission is, is higher. There's a large population of staff, there are a lot of patients, and then there are a lot of um, ventilation systems throughout the hospital, but there are also, there's equipment that's being moved from room to room and used from patient to patient. So hospital transmission is very possible. And then hospital microorganisms. Hospitals have a higher likelihood of having resistant strains of organisms and opportunistic pathogens. Because hosts can be immunocompromised, pathogens can take the opportunity to infect them because they have a weakened immune system. But really these resistant strains, and we'll see a graph on the next slide, are higher, um, have a higher likelihood of being in a hospital because hospitals are constantly cleaning, which is great, and they're constantly using different types of drugs and antibiotics, which is great, but that means those microorganisms in the hospital are constantly being exposed to those antimicrobials, and they have more chances to develop resistance. This graph gives you an idea of how much the hospital environment influences drug resistance compared to the community environment or anything outside of the hospital. So this graph on the y-axis, we have the prevalence of penicillin resistance in percentage, and then we have the year on the x-axis. And you'll see that one of these lines is showing hospital resistance, and one of these lines is showing community resistance. And you can see Staphylococcus aureus resistance to penicillin, the antibiotic penicillin, was much quicker and had a much higher uh, percent resistance earlier on compared to resistance in the community. And that is directly related to the amount of penicillin that's being administered in the hospital and the amount of times that Staphylococcus aureus has an opportunity to develop resistance from exposure in the hospital compared to out in the community. Now let's get into some important definitions. Disease versus infection. And we'll talk about kind of several other definitions over the next few slides. But first off, disease. Disease is any condition where your normal body function is damaged or impaired, not including a physical injury or disability. An infection is the successful colonization of a host by a microorganism. So infections can potentially lead to a disease and cause signs or symptoms and deviate from that normal function. And that's where deviating from the normal function would be a disease. So all diseases are not caused by microorganisms. Infections can lead to disease and are caused by microorganisms. And of course, microorganisms that can cause diseases are called pathogens. So make sure you know what a pathogen is. A couple of practice questions, and if you want to pause here and think about this before I go on, feel free to. But first off, you broke your arm doing some cool parkour tricks. Is this a disease? No, this is not a disease because this is just a physical injury. So this is not considered a disease if you break your arm. Does an infection always lead to a disease? No, not necessarily. So an infection is colonization of your body by some type of microorganism, but it's not always going to impair your body or lead to um, adverse effects. So think about typhoid Mary. She was a carrier for a disease. She was infected with salmonella typhi, but it did not lead to the disease presentation of typhoid fever. So they are not always present together, disease and infection. Some more definitions. We have signs, symptoms, and syndromes. Syndrome will actually be on the next slide. But signs and symptoms. Signs are talking about objective findings. So these are things that can be observed by a healthcare worker. When you go to the doctor and they take your vital signs, when they check your temperature and your heart rate and your breathing rate. Those are things that they can just observe and get a number for or see it clearly for themselves. Symptoms, on the other hand, 
are when a patient needs to explain in their own words how they're feeling. So these are subjective findings. It could be like explaining to your doctor that you feel nauseous or you have pain in your knee or you have a loss of appetite. Those are things that your doctor cannot observe for themselves. They have to hear from you how you're feeling. And then we have syndromes. A syndrome is the collection of signs and symptoms together. So it's bringing that information together in order to characterize a specific disease. And your doctor has to rely on collecting these signs and symptoms in order to diagnose a particular disease and find out what a potential causative agent is that's causing that disease. And of course, this is a really complicated process because lots of different microorganisms can share very similar signs and symptoms. For example, down here, there are many different types of bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens, and parasitic pathogens that can all be associated with diarrhea, but they're all caused by very different pathogens. So going through the process of collecting signs and symptom data and doing lab testing all accumulatively goes into the actual diagnosis of the disease and coming up with some type of treatment plan. So what is the difference between a sign and a symptom? A sign is objective, something that you can observe. A symptom is subjective, something that you have to hear from a patient and is explained to you about how they're feeling or what they're experiencing. A couple more important definitions. We have pathogenicity and virulence. Pathogenicity is just the ability to cause disease. So can a microorganism cause disease? It's just a qualitative yes or no. Virulence, on the other hand, is the degree of pathogenicity. So how virulent is a microorganism? How many cells need to be present in order to cause disease? And of course, pathogenicity and virulence would require that an organism can survive host defenses and cause damage. So these are going to be pathogens. Pathogens have a, are pathogenic, and they have some degree of pathogenicity called virulence. So virulence is the degree of pathogenicity, but how do we determine how virulent something is? We can do that by looking at the median infectious dose and median lethal dose. And these are tests that are typically done using animal models, groups of mice or rats. The median infectious dose, or ID50, would be the number of pathogenic cells or virions. Remember, virions are not considered living things. They're not cells. But the number of infectious agents that are required to cause an active infection in 50% of the inoculated animals. Whereas the median lethal dose, or LD50, is the number of pathogenic cells or virions or the amount of toxin that's created by these pathogens that's required to kill 50% of the infected animals. So we're looking at either an active infection or mortality. So you've run your experiment, and now how do you determine the LD50 or ID50? Well, on this graph, for example, on the y-axis, we have percent mortality in the experimental group. So we know that we're looking at the LD50, or the lethal dose, because we're looking at mortality. On the x-axis, we have the number of pathogenic agents, so cells or virions. And you would see, since we're interested in the lethal dose for 50% of the population, we look at 50% of the experimental group, and then we go over to our data, and then we go down to the x-axis and see where these intersect, and it's right here at 10 to the 4 pathogenic agents those 50% of the population experience death. So that's how you would determine the LD50 for this data set. And definitely keep in mind for both LD50 and ID50, the lower number of pathogenic agents required to lead to mortality or, or uh, the presentation of infection is higher virulence. So the fewer and fewer number of cells or virions you need to cause death or infection means that that is a more virulent pathogen. Now, pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is referring to how a disease is ultimately acquired. And so pathogenesis for an infectious disease, an infectious disease is caused by a microorganism, 
includes these steps. And we're going to go through all of them. How would you get an infectious disease? First off, you would have to come in contact with that infectious agent's home base or its reservoir. And the reservoir could be human, animal, or the environment. So you'd have to be exposed to it and make contact with that pathogen. It would have to be transmitted to the host somehow. So this was the different transmissions that we talk, talked about, like droplet or direct contact or some type of vehicle or vector. Again, though, you'd have to be exposed to it. And then you would have to, after being exposed to it, that pathogen would have to adhere or colonize you. So adhesion or, and colonization of the host. After it has adhered to you, your body is going to recognize something's wrong. And you, you have a lot of host defenses present in order to prevent infectious diseases. So in order to lead to the actual presentation of a disease, that means that pathogen would have to invade you and be able to evade host defenses and get past your immune system or hide from it. And ultimately, that is what would lead to infection. The completion of the actual replication cycles and the damage to the host is what we actually refer to as infection. If that pathogenic agent has gotten inside of you and that microorganism is actively replicating. And then finally, it would have to return to its reservoir or it would go to a new host after replicating inside of you. And it could leave through feces, urine, saliva. And this would be that portal of exit we talked about because we have a portal of entry and a portal of exit. So we're going to go into a little more detail about each of these, exposure, adhesion, invasion, and infection. And these are all steps of pathogenesis. Step one of pathogenesis is exposure. First, you have to make contact with that pathogen before you can ever potentially develop the disease that it causes, of course. So you have to make contact with it. And this is by coming into contact with it through its reservoir, whether that's animal or human or the environment, or some type of mode of transmission, like droplet or coming into contact with a fomite. Either way, you're making contact. Oftentimes, and especially since we're talking about uh, relevant human diseases, you're going to make contact through some type of portal of entry, and that could be through a break in the skin or through um, a mucous membranes or some type of break in your barrier that protects you from pathogens in the environment. There are also special types of microorganisms that ha have the ability of motility to actually kind of corkscrew their way past your skin barrier and enter that way. But there are many modes of uh, entry as we discussed before so make sure you review that portal of entry and exit slide now adherence step two of pathogenesis so you have come into contact with the pathogen now that pathogen needs to attach to a surface it's going to attach to your tissues or cells how is it going to do that of course we talked about this previously microbes do have special ways that they're able to attach to surfaces they could have fimbriae or pili for attachment. The outer covering of bacterial cells, they have a glycocalyx, that's the outer part of the cell envelope. It can be a slime layer or a capsule, and that can often help with attachment. There could be proteins on the outside of cells that help with specific attachment to certain tissues or cells. And then viruses have capsomers on their capsid, that, coat, that covering that protects their genetic material or glycoproteins on the surface that help with their very specific attachment to cell types. Now on to step three of pathogenesis, and this is invasion. So now you've come into contact with a pathogen, that pathogen has attached to your cells or tissues, and now it's going to evade your host defenses. And you have lots of host defenses to prevent infection, so pathogens have to be really good at evading these defenses. Some examples of defenses would be your phagocytic cells. So you have white blood cells that are phagocytic and they can actually eat or kind of consume microbes that get inside of you. But pathogens can have capsules that protect them from phagocytosis. They can produce an enzyme called coagulase, which kind of walls them off, off from your immune system. They're also, uh, certain pathogens are also able to survive inside of white blood cells and are intracellular parasites. 
in order to escape the immune system that way. And then of course, just a mention here that we do have opportunistic pathogens all over our body, but they need a compromised host. So we, in a lot of cases, you are kind of already, um, you already have attachment of these pathogens to your tissues and cells. But in the case of an opportunistic pathogen, they would need the opportunity of a compromised or weakened immune system in order to enter this invasion phase. This is just an interesting example of a pathogen that can evade our host defenses. This is Helicobacter pylori. And this type of pathogen, this is a bacteria that causes stomach ulcers, and this will come up later in the semester as well. But in our stomach, of course, we have, it's a very acidic environment, which is preventing a lot of pathogens from infecting us. But Helicobacter pylori is able to secrete this enzyme called urease. Urease neutralizes the stomach acid and allows this bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, to swim right through and, get, and attach to the epithelial cells of the stomach and not be bothered by all of those gastric juices and acidic environments, and they're able to adhere and attach to those cells, ultimately leading to stomach ulcers. And the final step of pathogenesis is infection. So after you come into contact with a pathogen, it has attached to cells or tissues, it has evaded the immune system, now it can start multiplying or replicating, and that is how you define infection. At the point of infection, the pathogen is multiplying or replicating. And it's really at this point that you are going to experience the signs and symptoms of a disease, because now you have a heightened number of bacterial cells or virions, and it's really alerted your immune system. Different types of infections, there are local infections that are going to be confined to a specific area of the body. A focal infection would be a localized pathogen or toxin that can spread to another location. And then a systemic infection would be disseminated throughout the whole body. That's often going to be disseminated through the circulatory system or the lymphatic system. So after going through pathogenesis, understand that the microorganisms that we're talking about that can lead to an infectious disease must have virulence factors. So they must be able to get past host defenses and lead to an infection that can ultimately lead to a disease. So virulence factors are really important for microorganisms that cause disease or pathogens. And virulence factors are going to be factors that increase an organism's degree of pathogenicity. So some examples of virulence factors or things that would make a pathogen more likely to cause a disease would be the presence of a capsule. So that's that outer glycocalyx layer that prevents phagocytosis or prevents our white blood cells from eating and consuming those bacterial cells. Different types of bacteria can have surface proteins that also prevent phagocytosis. So it's not always a capsule. They can have other specialized proteins as well. Exotoxins, so this would be a toxin that's secreted out into the environment. Remember that we also talked about endotoxins, and gram-negative bacteria have the endotoxin lipid A in LPS in their outer membrane. But exotoxins are actively secreted out into the environment. An example is leukocytins, so some bacteria can produce this toxin that actually destroys or breaks down leukocytes or white blood cells which are the cells that are really important for our immune response. And then we have antigenic drift and antigenic shift. And this is a change in antigens on the surface of viruses over time. An antigenic drift change would be a small change in those antigens, and antigenic shift would be a large change in those antigens. But by changing those antigens, the viruses are changing how easily our immune systems can recognize and respond to that infection again. The last topic of discussion for this lecture is periods of disease. And we're going to look at this graph right here. And then the next slide is going to uh, talk about this in more detail, like have a slide of words for you to review. But we're going to look at this graph first. So on the y-axis, we have the number of pathogenic particles in red. And then on the y-axis also, we have the severity of the symptoms in blue.
and then the x-axis we have the passing of time so we have over time and I really want you to take away from this graph the relationship it's really showing here between the number of pathogenic particles and the severity of the symptoms so the more pathogenic particles you have in your system is directly related to the severity of the symptoms like because that means your immune system is working really hard to fight that infection as the, that pathogen is replicating within you. So first off, we have the incubation period. And during the incubation period, you had just come into contact with a pathogen and you aren't really experiencing any signs or symptoms yet. You don't know you're sick yet. During the prodromal period, there's an increase in pathogenic particles. The pathogen is starting to replicate. And during this period, you may begin to experience general signs or symptoms. During the period of illness, again, we have our pathogenic particles increasing. This is where you would experience the classical signs and symptoms of that infection. And now your immune system is working really hard, of course, and you're starting to see a decrease in the number of pathogenic particles. And this is the period of decline. So this is um, great because your immune system is working hard and you're experiencing a decline in pathogenic particles, but this is also the period of time where you could experience a secondary infection because your immune system is weakened by dealing with this primary infection. And then finally, we have the period of convalescence. So this is most often whenever someone's going to return to normal functions and the disease has left and you are not experiencing signs and symptoms anymore. So can all infectious diseases be contagious during all five periods of disease? And all five periods of disease is talking about the incubation period, the prodromal period, the period of illness, the period of decline, and the period of convalescence. And yes, absolutely, depending on the type of infectious disease, and we'll see um, an example on the next slide, infectious diseases can potentially be contagious, meaning you can give the infection to someone else during all five periods of disease. So yes, infectious diseases can be contagious during all five periods of disease, but the period of infectivity or when that disease is infectious is really depending on the type of pathogen that's causing the infection and the type of disease. The example here is meningitis. And meningitis is going to be an inflammation of the meninges or those membranes that cover your brain and spinal cord, your central nervous system. And meningitis can be caused by bacteria, and it can be caused by viruses. People with bacterial meningitis are going to be contagious during the incubation period for up to a week before you even have the prodromal period and start experiencing symptoms. Compared to people with viral meningitis, they are contagious when those first signs and symptoms appear during the prodromal period. So people with bacterial meningitis are contagious before experiencing signs and symptoms of a disease, before they know that they're sick. Viral meningitis, you become contagious once you start experiencing those signs and symptoms. The last slide for this lecture, are all infectious diseases considered contagious? And pause here if you want to think about it for a bit on your own. But all infectious diseases are not contagious. Contagious would mean that a disease is communicable, that it can be transmitted from host to host. An infectious disease that would not be considered contagious would be tetanus. That's an infection with the bacterium Clostridium tetani, but you are not going to be giving that disease to someone else just because you're infected with Clostridium tetani. Compared to influenza, which is the virus that causes the flu, that is an infectious disease that is communicable and contagious because it can be transmitted from person to person to person.